Let's stand to our feet and let's give a big Way World outreach to our very own BJ Sims. Come on, come on, church, let's give it up. While we're celebrating, can we thank God for godly leadership and pass them Come on, you can do better than that. There you go. And while you're standing, now listen. There was a lady on this stage that said that she was on life support 10 times and she's still on this stage proclaiming that Jesus can heal. This is not a game. We are standing in a supernatural church. Can we praise God for not just the way, but for the kingdom of God? Come on, praise him for a church that still saves. Now listen, y'all ain't met her yet, but we family. Can y'all just praise God for my wife? She's right there, Jessica Sims. And as you thank God for her, go on and have your seat. Let's get to work. Today I want to teach from Romans chapter 5. If you've been following along in the growth book, you already know that that's the day that we're, we're on today. But I want to teach from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. If you're watching online, I give you permission to take notes, but do not tune off. Um, and we'll be reading out of the NLT. Here it goes. Therefore, since we have been made right, say made right. In God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved. Say, we don't deserve it. Undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can, that is a perfect place to praise. Amen, brother. We can rejoice too. When we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he, he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Father God, this is none of us and all of you. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some years ago, I remember preaching this text. I was standing on stage in Bellflower, California, teaching to a room full of youth pastors and youth ministers at a conference called The Takeover. And I remember teaching this message about salvation. And it was centered around three points. You can write these three points down really quick. Number one is we don't deserve salvation. Number two, we cannot earn salvation. And here's the best part. The devil cannot take salvation away from us. So that's we don't deserve it. We can't earn it. And the devil cannot take it away from us. Now I'm preaching this message. I get done preaching. I walk off the stage and I check my phone just to make sure nobody retweeted me or nothing like that. You know, you, know, you just want to check your phone. So I check my phone and I see six missed calls from my sister. And something tells me to go outside and give her a call. So I go outside and I call my sister. And before I can get a word out, she screams, daddy's gone. While I was preaching the gospel, my dad was dying. That means when I was in Bellflower, California, preaching that God will save, that God can heal, that God can deliver, I get a phone call from my sister saying that my dad was dying in Chicago, Illinois. Now, here's the interesting part, and I'm going to be real quick with this part, is that somewhere along my journey, I started to believe that I deserve salvation because I went to church every day. I started to believe that I deserve salvation because I was preaching the gospel. I started to believe that I deserve salvation because I felt like I was doing everything right. And what I really was doing was making an idol out of my own flesh. I was idolizing my own efforts and making God feel bad for not doing what I wanted him to do. That's called Christian manipulation, a.k.a. Christian witchcraft. The only reason we're coming to church is because we're trying to convince God to bless us. The only reason we're going to our DG is because we think if we go enough that we're going to be rich and get a Rolls Royce. But that's not the gospel. The gospel says this, that you did nothing and he did everything. <laughs> so a few weeks after that, I'm standing on, on stage in Chicago, Illinois, and I had the privilege 
of preaching my dad's funeral. And remember in Bellflower, there was a room full of youth pastors, youth ministers, youth workers, pastors and leaders, people who profess to know Jesus. But now at my father's funeral, who was a drug addict, now I'm having to preach the same gospel to a room of prostitutes and preach the same gospel to a room of drug addicts and preach the gospel to a room full of, of, of ex-gang members and preach the gospel to anybody that will hear. And one thing I realized was the same gospel that the drug addict and the prostitute and the gang member and those who are recovering from sin needed was the same gospel that I needed and it wasn't something different or a different message it wasn't because I was smart but the same gospel which is the power that brings salvation still worked for the prostitute the same gospel that worked for the pastor worked for the gang member the same gospel that worked for me worked for the drug addict the same gospel it's the gospel it's not me it's the gospel the simplicity of the message is all we need. And sometimes we just get super confused because we actually think we're doing a good job. Can, are y'all bold enough to say this? Everybody say, we suck. Amen. Thank you for saying it. I didn't say it. Y'all said it about yourself. Verse 1 said, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. Point number one is very, very simple. I want you to write this in your note. It's three words, and it says, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's it. Now, that term is very hard for us to understand because we live in a democracy. But if you go around the world and you start to study different forms of government, you understand that anybody that had the title or the position of Lord, it means that they had all authority, they had all power, they had all control, and everyone had to submit to the word of the Lord. So when we say Jesus is Lord, what we're saying is is that there's no one who is more powerful than Jesus. So anytime someone says Jesus is Lord, we're saying Jesus is is controlling everything. So now, since Jesus is Lord, we understand, and it's going to be a quick explanation, the kingdom of God is not the name of a local church. There's no such thing as the kingdom of God, Missionary Baptist Church. That's not a thing. The kingdom, kingdom of God is this big government, right? Miles Monroe said it's God's way of doing things, right? And the church is in the kingdom of God. So now, since the kingdom of God is a government, every government has a judicial system. Now, here's a question. I know we're in San Bernardino, but I don't want y'all to lie in church, all right? Turn to your neighbor and say, don't lie. Turn behind you tell them, don't lie. Pastor Marco, I want you to watch this so you can know the congregation. How many of y'all in this room have ever been to jail? Raise your hand right now. Woo, Jesus. All right. All right. All right. You bold. You bold. Somebody ask them what you do. No, don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't tell them what you did. We don't want to know you healed, you delivered, you've been set free. We don't need to know what you did in your past. We ain't trying to go there, right? Now, if you've, if you've ever been to jail before, right, before you're sentenced, you have to go to a courtroom, right? Sometimes you go to jail and you're just waiting on your court date. Ask me how I know because I've been to jail several times, right? So, so you got to go to court to get the sentencing, right? Now, in every courtroom, this is the anatomy of a courtroom. You got a judge. You have a public defender or the defense attorney. You have the prosecutor. And you have you, the criminal, right? So in every case, (laughs) in every case, that means that your fate is literally in the control of the person who is able to make the decision to either pronounce your freedom or pronounce you going to jail for the rest of your life, right? Now, here's the interesting part. The prosecutor is always saying, write this scripture down, but do not go to it. It is Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It says this. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and and the authority of his Christ. For, listen to this, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Which is telling you that the job of Satan, the job of the enemy is to accuse you in front of God. That's why we have this, this whole idea of that the enemy or the devil is a liar, right? Because his goal is, is to try to convince God that you're not worthy of salvation. 
The goal is he tries to convince God of, of all of the evil that you have done. That's why he shouldn't bless you. And if we have people in our lives that are always accusing us of we not reading the Bible too much, you're not studying enough, you're not doing this, tell them next time that you're acting like the devil. Accusation is the fruit of the enemy. We do not accuse people. We convict them with the gospel. So anytime someone tries to accuse you that you're not doing enough, tell them, listen, devil, please get up out of my face. So now if we know that the enemy is the prosecutor, now we have two other seats that are unoccupied. Isaiah 33, 22 says this. It says, listen to this. It's very interesting. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our ruler. The Lord is our king. He will save us. So that means that Jesus becomes the judge and the attorney. So anytime the enemy tries to convince you that you're not doing enough, Jesus steps in as the judge and then he begins to fight for you. Because the Bible says that he goes before you, he fights the battle, and he gives you the victory. So now, me saying Jesus is Lord is not just church jargon. It's just not church and ease. When I say Jesus is Lord, I'm literally declaring that Jesus has all control over my life because of the blood shed on the cross. Point number two. We're justified by faith, not by law. We're justified by faith, not by law. We see this in Romans 5 too. It says, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. The, 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 the term made right literally just communicates this. It's this idea of being justified, right? So when you're justified, it means that you're, you've went through the process of justification. Now, this is something that's hard for a lot, of us, a lot of us to believe because we grew up with parents who have been traumatized. We grew up in churches who have been traumatized. But here's the truth. There's nothing that you can do to reverse what Jesus did on the cross. We weren't excited enough about that, but I'm going to say it one more time so that way we can think about it. Because some of us had a few slip-ups this morning. And Pastor Mark was talking about his road rage, but I got road rage too. And some of y'all do too. And y'all ain't just taking a legal U-turn. Some of y'all cussing people out because they didn't cut you off in traffic. But here's the truth. There's nothing that you can do to reverse what Jesus has already done. So he's not, look, there you go. That's better. That's better. Because now you understand that even when I mess up, all I got to do is repent. The Bible says repentance is turning from that sin, turning back to God. You just can't turn from sin and try to replace it. When I had an alcohol problem, I was like, I was convincing myself, like, I'm just going to stop drinking. But I'm going to replace it with something else, right? So what I did was I started drinking coffee. I was like, I ain't going to drink the alcohol, but I'm going to drink coffee a lot. But really what I was doing was just furthering the addiction. So instead of, because the same thing goes for this. If you're addicted to alcohol, that's a sin. But if you're addicted to food, that's a sin too. <laughs> so you're talking about people that drink too much Jack Daniels, but you ain't talking about yourself that's in the line at Popeye's every night. It's gluttony. <laughs> it's the same thing. And you think you're good. But your idol is food. I'm just talking about myself too. Don't eat trip. We all have different things. I'm going to move past that. It's all good. <laughs> Go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 14. I'm going to read this. Then we're going to go through our last point. Then we're going to have some fun at the altar. For all who depend on the law, seeking, and this is in the amplified version, if you want to know. For all who depend on the law, seeking justification and salvation by obedience to the law and the observance of rituals are under, listen to this, a curse. For it is written, cursed or condemned to destruction is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law, so as to practicing them. 
Now it is clear that no one is justified, that is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty and placed in right standing before God by the law. For the righteous or the just and the upright shall live by faith. But the law does not rest on or require faith. It has nothing to do with faith. But instead, the law says, he who practices them, the things prescribed by the law, shall live by them instead of faith. Verse 13, Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs or crucified on a tree or a cross in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might also come to the Gentiles so that we will all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. This is something that we have to correct as a church. We say it all the time. I repent for saying it several times. Salvation is not free. We just didn't pay for it. Salvation costs a Savior's life to afford the sin of everyone in this room. And when we say salvation is free, it's negligence to the suffering and the sacrifice that Jesus actually made on the cross. Salvation was too expensive for your bank account. In Genesis, I'm going to close this because we got to stop. In Genesis, we read the story of the fallen Adam. Now, in today's time, we have several laws and several rules. In the book of Genesis, they had one rule to follow. That's it. Just one rule. God said, whatever you do, let's back up a little bit. He gave the man a wife. He didn't have no bills. He even gave him a river and trees and plants. He gave him all of these things so that way he didn't have a care in the world. And although Adam had everything he needed for success, he still broke the only law. This is a picture of humanity that no matter how good we think we got it, no matter how much effort we think we can put forth, no matter what we do, at the end of the day, if Adam could not obey one law, we can't obey a million. We don't even know all the laws. There's a law in Idaho that says you can't have an ice cream cone in your back pocket. That's crazy. Who would have knew that unless you studied it? I had to Google that. It was not, it's not possible. So the plan that God had since the beginning was to send what we know as the second Adam, which is Jesus. Because what he did was he reversed the curse that the first Adam gave us. He became the curse. He died. And now because he died, we can live. Now, here's the issue. Here's the issue. We cannot truly, and I told BYA this Friday, we can't serve God and our flesh at the same time. And some of us, I'm going to say it because we're in San Bernardino and we're supposed to be gangster out here. We got to be tough. So I'm going to stick my chest out and say it. Some of us didn't get saved by the gospel. We got saved by religion. We learned how to go to church. We learned how to say the Lord's Prayer. We learned all of this church jargon. And we're walking around miserable because we don't have the salvation that comes from Jesus. The Bible doesn't say this, but I'll say it. Anyone who does not have the salvation that comes through the preaching of the gospel is miserable and will always be miserable. The Bible says that there's no peace for the wicked. There's no peace. There's no such thing. And some of us, the reason why we're in the situation that we're in right now mentally, physically, emotionally, is because we have not allowed Jesus to be Lord over our lives. We allow church to be Lord over our life. 
We allow pastors to be Lord of our life. We allow discipleship to be Lord of our life. We even idolize baptism. That's the Lord of our life. But without relationship, you're not allowing Jesus to be what he said he will be for you. So we got a generation of people who fell in love with the bride and not the bridegroom. Fell in love with the church and were not Jesus himself. So now we're raising many Pharisees and Sadducees. People who can abide by laws and people who can follow the rules. But if you go to the, 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 to the best elementary school in this county, they can do the same thing. And they don't have Jesus. So we find ourselves at a crossroad. You can stand. Musicians, you can play because it's 816. We got to get to work. We got to do it. I know we got time at the altar. The altar is where it happens. All this other stuff is just prerequisite. This is the most important time of the entire worship. Listen to me. In this room today, I will hate for you to believe that you're saved and you're not. Now, I know we're going to say, well, all you got to do is believe in your heart and confess that Jesus is Lord, but you haven't confessed because you didn't understand. You can only live at the level that you're taught. That's why we have so many systems here at The Way. So that way now you can actually, listen, go through holy warriors and become a holy warrior. It's not just a class. It's to equip you to actually go out and do the work. One of the scriptures that we heard today was Matthew 25, and it's a parable of the talents. You know, it's, it's about this, this process where this man, he was going on a trip, the Bible says, to a far country. And it says that he left his servants, all of us in here, in charge. And he wanted us, what the Bible says, is to do business until he returns. So he gave ten to one, he gave five to the other, he gave two to somebody else, gave one to the other one. Everyone did what they can and multiply and made sure they gave the master more when he returned back. But the one who only had one gift, he didn't do anything. The Bible says he hid it. Maybe he had a good reason for hiding. I don't know. Maybe he was scared. Maybe he didn't think that he was ready. Maybe he thought that, you know what, I, I really just don't even want to don't want to even want to try because I didn't have good parents and my dad wasn't in my life. He had excuses. The same way we have excuses, he had excuses. But listen to what the master said. He said, you wicked and lazy servant. That means the servant who is unwilling to multiply is wicked and lazy. That means you can go to church your entire life. Come here. You can come from the 9 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service. But if you're not multiplying what you learned, you are wicked and lazy. The whole point of the Bible was to produce, was to multiply, to take dominion. And some of us got saved to warm the pews. That's religion. T tonight, I have a question. It's very important. It's very, very important. Because unless... You allow Jesus to be Lord, then you will not reap the benefits of what the cross really provides. Now listen, the goal of the gospel is always transformation. And the goal wasn't the cross, it was the crown. We have idolized the cross because we, because we, we relate to suffering more than we do to success because life is hard. But the goal was that when the Savior died, that he will come up and get a crown. So my question is, why don't, we, why don't we walk around with crowns on our necklace? Why is it just the cross? It wasn't just the cross. It was the crown. And God wants to give you a crown today. But it's at the other end of your participation. This is the only part you play in the picture. Is that you actually believe in your heart. Some of us have been lying to ourselves, and it's okay. Because we haven't believed it in our heart. Sometimes you need impartation to believe that. You've been unsaved for longer than you've been trying to be saved. So you got to undo some of that. That's why you need community. You need people. 
But tonight, I want to invite you to make the most important decision that you will ever make. Nothing else matters outside of this. If you don't know Jesus as Lord, you're missing out. We all struggle. I told you I was preaching a gospel message and my dad died mid-sermon. In that season, I literally felt like everything in my life was falling apart. But I remembered that, that God is not like man and he cannot lie. And that everything has to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now I'm living in the fruit of my decision to follow a man who is Lord. Now I'm living in the decision to follow a man who can save me, who can handle me, who can deal with my insecurities. He's not going to be agitated when I call him at 3 a.m. He's going to pick up and say, what's up, BJ? What's the issue? Who we got to fight today? Listen, you need Jesus today. And I'm going to say this. We're going to open this altar. But this is what I want you to do before we make the decision. I love this. You guys are always on it. I want you to have a conversation with your neighbor really quick. And I want you to ask them, hey, man, hey, girl. How's your relationship with Jesus? If you were serrated on a scale of 1 to 10, what would it be? If they say 10, throw them to the altar, okay? Just throw them up here, slingshot them to the front. Because they're religious. But listen, if it's anything under a 5, I'm going to count to five, and I want you to meet me at the altar right now. Now, I, I don't need nobody lying tonight because you can leave this place tonight, and you may not return next Wednesday or next Sunday. The point is, is to save you today. Not in case you die, but in case Jesus comes back, and we all go live with him. We want you to be invited to the party. And if you don't get saved tonight, you can't come. Real talk. One, two, Three, four, five. Get to the altar now. Come on, they're coming from everywhere. Come on. It's not by power. It's not by might. But it's by his spirit. It's by his spirit. Come on. Come on. Come on. There you go. It's no need to be ashamed. Come to the altar. Give your life to Jesus. It's Jesus who can save. It's Jesus who heals. It's Jesus who sets free. It's Jesus who delivers. It's Jesus who is high and lifted up. It's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It's him. It's God. And we want you to win. Now listen, before we pray, come on. We're still coming. We're still coming. Everybody repeat this prayer to me. Say, Jesus. Say, Jesus. Thank you for dying for my sin and raising again on the third day so I can be forgiven. Jesus, be my Lord and be my director because I need you. Jesus, you know I'm messed up, but I trust you as Lord. So thank you that I'm saved. Everywhere in the room, give it up for a room filled with saved people. Come on, we can do better than that. Come on, praise your God. Praise your God. Let arrowheads fill it. Let watermen hear your praise. God, how many were blessed by that message tonight? I love what he said. The gospel is nothing we did, but everything that God did. How many know that that's true? Now, what a word tonight. We're thankful for Pastor BJ. Can we give a hand for Pastor BJ? His first message here at, our, at, at his church, at our church. We just want to remind everybody that, you know, we're getting ready for one of the biggest, most, the, the biggest shifts, the biggest weeks of our church's history is next week. It's going to happen. Be there to be a part of it. 
your tickets are available for you. You can go right now on the app. There's a booth right there in the foyer. You can get your tickets. Don't miss your chance to be a part of what God is doing here at Growth Conference next week. But we love you, church. God bless you. If you need prayer, come forward. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to shake your hand. Love to just, you know, get to get connected with you. Also, this Sunday, we're going to have a great message. God is going to move tonight. So be here this Sunday for a powerful service. Love you. God bless you. I'm going to pray for you. Father, bless those that are came tonight. Bless them. Send them, Father God. Be with them wherever they go, Father, and lead them and guide them. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we all say amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful night, church.